Ramanan, you can start. Yeah. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the 46th lecture of Varamira Science Forum. Uh, today is a special day for us, and so I will give a brief about um, our journey till now, and then a uh, speaker intro, and then over to the speaker. So Madras has always been, as you can see in my presentation, Madras has always been an important center of science uh, with visits and speeches by Nobel laureates from 50s to 70s. And uh, it was accessible to everyone interested. Okay, Somewhere along, the speeches and visits became more specialized and while they do continue to happen even today, they are not for amateurs and other interested people. So Varamira Science Forum was formed to plug this gap and provide a forum where pe ordinary people can listen to the latest on science and technology. The speakers need not be professionals, but can also be interested amateurs. All we need is people who can tell a good story as a starting point. Now, 45 lectures later and seven courses conducted on ancient Indian mathematics and astronomy, I take this opportunity to thank the community of followers on Facebook, YouTube, and other social media on behalf of the admin team. We wouldn't be here without you. And as one of the followers since the start of the forum, which is August 2017, I also take this opportunity to congratulate the admin team for the successful entry into the fifth year. See, it is not easy to talk um, science and tech, even if people are interested. And this team has not only managed to do that, but more importantly, sustained and grown over four years and built a reasonable following in the process. See, these are the talks that we have done over a period of time. And so uh, my wishes to the admin team is may the lecture talks and courses conducted grow in scope and reach further, okay? which brings us to the speaker of the day. Uh, so uh, our Gobu doesn't need much of an introduction and is a familiar face in the science and heritage circles of Metros. He has an MS in computer science from Texas AM University. He worked in the software industry, which included a five-year stint at Microsoft. He writes on science, heritage, art, and history, and the, his essays have been published in newspapers and magazines like the Week, the New Indian Express, and Swarajya. Currently, he teaches at Savita Engineering College. Gopo also happens to be one of the co-founders of the forum. He started the whole journey four years back with his talk on Antoine Lavoisier and the origin of modern chemistry. So who better than him to get us into the fifth year with a talk on James Watt's steam engine? Being an excellent storyteller that Gopo is, I am as much eager as uh, everyone here to listen to what he has to say. Over to you, Gopu. Thank you, Ramanan. Um, a few uh, close on your presentation, then you can start mine. So thank you, Ramanan, for that excellent introduction. Uh, welcome, everybody. Um, I hope, uh, thank you again, all of you, for supporting this forum for uh, four years and helping us walk into the fifth one. Uh, we, you know, I'd like to thank my fellow founders, Rajagopal and Venkat Raman and uh, uh, Mohan uh, Krishnamurti and uh, people who have been there from day one, uh, like Patri, who's hosting all these programs, SL Nasiman, who's been recording a, a bunch of these programs, Ramanan, who uh, joined uh, an enormous number of people, Professor Swaminathan, who was kind of the inspiration for it with uh, THT, whose model we have kind of adopted, the government for host allowing us to host at uh, TVA, TVA faculty themselves, and so on. Uh, so without further ado, let me go into today's topic. Uh, as uh, Ramanan mentioned, uh, my first talk for this forum was on Antoine Lavoisier. Uh, and Lavoisier's discovery was of modern chemistry, especially his discovery of uh, the oxygen and the different elements and so on, uh, is officially credited to the year 1774. Now, James Watt's uh, famous steam engine uh, that he first really sold, he was in development for several years before that, is in 1775. So the year after that, uh, though he invented it a little earlier, his uh, official patent and first sale are in you know, 1775. So it's the year after that. So it's a very interesting period. 
Um, so we'll look at those steam engines and we'll look at this uh, story because it's a popular story, but uh, we have a lot of what I call misleading legends. So a very simple answer to who invented the steam engine usually is that James Watt invented it, but is that the real case? Turns out it's not. These are six famous engineers who should really be credited with the development of the steam engine. And I've categorized them into two sets. The upper set would be Dennis Papin, who's a Frenchman, Thomas Savery, William Newcomb, and James Watt, who are all Englishmen, and then Richard Trevithick and uh, George Stevenson, uh, also Englishmen. So England has a lot to do with it. Uh, but the first four, and James Watt, the most famous of them all, uh, really started, really built only a stationary engine. They didn't build what we call the railway engine, the mobile locomotive engine. Uh, it's only 20 years after, you know, uh, after James Watt's invention, the Trevithick, or 25 years later, the Trevithick came up with the first locomotive engine. It wasn't very functional. And uh, only in uh, 1825, five years after James, James Watt had died, George Stevenson successfully ran a railway engine from uh, one city to another. That is what we call the locomotive engine. So for the early history of the steam engine is really of a stationary engine. So the T story, of course, is the most famous story of the steam engine. The legend goes that James Watt was, uh, as a little boy, used to watch a tea kettle boil. He saw that tea lid, you know, flutter because of the pressure of the steam. And so that was inspired him to build a steam engine. So now the question asks, because England only started drinking tea uh, with the advent of the East India Company and so on, which was importing tea, this happened around the 16th, 17th centuries. And James Watt belongs to the uh, 18th century. Uh, China has been drinking tea for a thousand years before, so why didn't some Chinese engineer invent the steam engine? Or, you know, it doesn't have to be tea. Any boiling water would do. China was boiling noodles, India was boiling idlis and, you know, steaming idlis. People have been boiling water for centuries, right? For millennia, when prehistoric man has probably been boiling stuff. Or why didn't the ancient Egypt who built the pyramids or the Sumerians, you know, started, you know, farming and literature and all kinds of amazing things and the Greeks, you know, somebody like even even somebody who's a little uh, about a century earlier than James Watt, like Isaac Newton or Galileo, or the very famous Archimedes, supposed to be a brilliant ancient Greek engineer. Why didn't these people invent the steam engine? So most people think this is the steam engine, right? This is what is called the locomotive steam engine. It's a railway engine. It's able to move itself. You have a very large boiler. You have a you know, big container of coal. You have wheels. It pulls trains and all that. This only happened, you know, really after 1820, though the first uh, mobile engines ran, ran a little earlier. The engines on um, uh, trains, uh, pulling trains, really ran, and they ran 100 years after the original steam engine, which you look at today. My engagement point was this, when I downloaded a book, uh, a biography of James Watt by Andrew Carnegie. Andrew Carnegie is famous for uh, the steel industry in the United States. He was it has, at his time one of the richest men, perhaps the richest man in the world. So the, the richest man in the world writes about the most famous engineer. And the book is out of print. At least it was when I, uh, you know, when I first downloaded and read it. And now I think it's on available. But can you imagine this? Uh, compare it with the most successful book that of recent times, uh, Harry Potter. It's also by an English person. She was one of the poorest persons in England. Like she's not the poorest, but she was very poor. The famous J.K. Rowling, the author's story is fairly familiar. She writes about a non-existent magical wizard, the house and all that. And that's the most uh, successful book of all time. Oh, here is the most transformative person, James Watt, whose engine really transformed society, launched effectively. Some people think that was the one thing that launched the Industrial Revolution and changed you know, the economics of mankind, the history of mankind, the, the ability to uh, do things. And a book about him by one of the richest persons was out of print. The, the contrast was just uh, stark for me. So, but let's get into the story. Uh, before James Watt, this, there is a brief history because James Watt was not, the, he didn't invent the steam engine. He made a, a really uh, effective and working steam engine. So the first person really credited with this is somebody called Dennis Papin. And this is a kind of a portrait of him, of Wikipedia, basically. Dennis Papin has, you know, very great celebrity connections. 
he worked with and for christian huygens the famous uh, danish scientist huygens himself did an engine he he powered an engine with uh, gunpowder he actually had a, a gunpowder based engine which is an entirely different topic and of uh, you know uh, we should talk about it sometime then papen fell in with gregory leibniz who was famous for inventing calculus and uh, he was trying to there are stories that he tried to set up a, a boat with a steam engine in uh, in in the river seine in paris in france then leibniz uh, asked advice him paid for his passage to england where he came to england royal society had been established with such great scientists as robert hooke robert boyle isaac newton etc and papin uh, worked a little bit for hooke and boyle he actually made for them and he created wrote a lot of papers you know he's working as secretarial stuff he was an assistant at the society and all that. but strangely he was not very well recognized we don't have any documents except allegations we don't know if he really built it but there are just some papers and part of the reason that he was he probably didn't get any recognition was because uh, because he had the leibniz connection historians suppose that uh, newton who was the most influential member of the royal society when papin came over uh couldn't tolerate them and so uh, you know put an end to or didn't encourage uh, papen very much uh which is ridiculous and ironic because imagine if newton had uh, uh, got his hands on the engine you know designed it did some work uh, we don't know where it would be but while papen we don't know whether he did it or not we just know that theoretically he did some work on it wrote some papers and all that we are sure about that the first person to really get a patent for a working steam engine is a person called thomas savery and his patent was uh, first granted in 1698 um this patent was a 14 year patent and this then got extended by british parliament or uh, british government to 1733 so that's a very impressive uh, engine so savery should really be given the credit of building the first steam engine but most historians don't uh, think so strangely james watt was only born uh, you know 3 years after the savery engines patent died but let's look at what the savery savery uh, created this is a model that is kept in one of the museums and i you know borrowed this picture from the internet um it was really called a fire engine and the purpose of the engine was literally to raise water it was really a pump uh, it's a large closed cylinder not very large you know moderately large size closed cylinder it had water inside and it had a piston and uh, the steam would push up the piston but the steam was only pushing up the piston it was not doing the mechanical work that the engine would do so what would happen uh, what happened apparently was then they douse the engine they douse the cylinder with cold water imagine heating it up and pushing the cylinder up, uh, pushing the uh, piston up uh, then cooled it and what happened was therefore was that immediately the steam condensed once the steam condensed the uh, you know the uh, pressure uh, collapsed so what happens was uh, they created a vacuum because the steam condensed and became this thing the pressure of the you know the expanding vapors only uh, dramatically reduced so the piston moved downwards and the downward stroke was used to power a lever and to you know there was a pump of or a bucket or something like that attached to the other end of the lever and that upward motion when the downward motion of the piston happened the upward motion of the Uh, other lever pulled up water so what in some in this we, we have a closed cylinder here but the savery probably used an open cylinder so the atmospheric pressure really pushed the uh, piston back so really so they it, they don't really call it a steam engine they call it an atmospheric engine because the uh, proper mechanical work is done though the piston lifts up but the proper mechanical work is done by atmospheric pressure pushing down on a on the piston uh, which goes down easily because there is a vacuum in the uh in the cylinder so this was not very reliable it uh, apparently frequently failed uh, because of the high pressure of steam metallurgy was not very advanced uh, the cylinders were not all that stable uh, they it used an enormous amount of coal to produce uh, you know very little energy and the maximum amount it could uh, pull uh, was about 10 meters so the pump was only useful to pull up 10 meters of water right so even that they found useful um this actually was a business model people were selling these uh, engines uh, savery was selling his engine uh, we we have we even have records and the price range varied from 150 to 200 pounds uh, in you know 17th century costs for the engine 17th and 18th century costs for the engine so where the people were buying this engine is really a pump 
but uh, the person to come up with an improvement on this was somebody called William Newcomen. And this is a picture of a Newcomen's team engine from a very nice uh, couple of videos. I'll share the link of the videos. You can go see it. This one was much more effective. It was an improvement on the Severy engine and it would pump a lot more water. And it was much more effective. It could, uh, work, you know, it could, it could move up and down about 12 times a minute. So it could, uh, and it was much more effective also. It could lift water 150 feet up uh, rather than 30 feet up by the first one. This one was also an open cylinder atmospheric engine. So this is also, while it is operated based on steam and cooling the uh, steam, uh, cooling the cylinder and therefore causing a collapse uh, because of, uh, uh, you know, vacuum and then atmospheric pressure would act on the piston. And the mechanic, you can see the mechanism here. Here's the cylinder, there's the piston that's pushing it up. There is the lever attached to it. The other end of the lever is a, a kind of a, a water pulling mechanism, like a you know, thing that go into a well. So it operated on a, a, a principle of atmospheric pressure. So these two engines are really called atmospheric engines rather than steam engines. The advantage of the Newcomen engine was that it was much safer than the Savery engine. I'm not going into technical details. I don't know about it, but it was still very inefficient. 99% uh, of the energy that was was wasted. I mean, it was still get the cylinder, the whole cylinder was still getting cooled. So they are heating it up, cooling it down, and then they're heating it up and cooling it down, and you know, several times a minute. And you can see how uh, incredibly inefficient it was. Uh, and most of the uh, uh, you know power was being produced by a coal coal based fire to heat up the water. But even this was extraordinarily useful. And coal miners didn't simply buy the engine; they actually paid a royalty on the engine on an annual basis. If we think about it, this is kind of what we do for our uh, uh, you know, software. A lot of softwares you're really paying, like an operating system like Windows or Office, you're paying royalty for it. Uh, you know, you're paying an annual fee on something like that. So it went from 200 to 450 pounds a year, and coal miners used it. Now look at the irony here. Uh, the most useful thing that the uh, steam engine, or really what they call, they used to call it a fire engine because it operated based on fire, right? The most in, in effective thing that it did was uh, pull up water. What it was doing was it was helping coal miners uh, you know, pump water away from coal mines because coal mines uh, were underground. So you had to go dip, dig deep into the ground to uh, dig out the coal. And after a particular level, if you started digging, uh, subterranean water poured into, poured into the mines and they needed to pump the water out before they could access the coal. And so that was the most useful thing that they did. And this is kind of a schematic picture of what the Newcomen engine looked like. There is a boiler here, and there is a fire underneath the boiler, usually uh, based on coal. So you could use firewood, but you, as you will uh, see, uh, it was lack of firewood that was prompting the... Uh, Britain really almost completely demolished all its forests. Uh, Britain is an island, remember, uh, and it had only a limited amount of forests and firewood. And the population at that point was booming. And they were just using up all the wood they can. It's a very cold country. They needed firewood for heating, for cooking, everything. And uh, what was and they were using inefficient en engines and fireplaces and so on. And the water in the boiler would just push up, you know, go into here and you know make form a steam and push this piston up. And note this, notice that this cylinder is open on the top. So when the cylinder is pushed all the piston is pushed up all the way, you cool down the cylinder. Then the you know uh, suddenly there's all the steam uh, below this condenses. And then there is no pressure, and the atmospheric pressure pushes down the piston, and that's how it works. This is the model of a Newcomen engine, right? We know a little bit more about William Newcomen that he was an iron monger or a blacksmith. So you can imagine that somebody like that would be the one working with the cylinder, metal cylinder, metal pistons, all kinds of things like that. He actually paid a patent fee to Savery Sayers. Remember, Savery Sayers uh, had a patent, extended the patent up to uh, 1833. Uh, I'm sorry, 1733. And uh, Newcomen, so his improved engine, even though he, his engine was better, uh, the model was the same as Savery's, so he had to pay a patent for the idea. And this is kind of how it worked. Okay, so there is a, there's an animation from the web. There's a coal firing it, there's water, this pink stuff is seam, it's pushing up the piston, it's pushing this other lever, it's pulling up the water, and then there is a water valve here that, you know, uh, condenses, it sprays the thing every once in a while, cooling down the cylinder and so on. And so uh, the early steam engines were used in situations like this, where there would be a house for the boiler, for the cylinder, for the piston and all that, and it'd be pulling out over here, and it'd be pumping water from uh, some, uh, you know, whatever it is. And they are not always used for coal mines. 
though that was the substantial thing anything anything underneath uh, underground that needed water pumped out uh, the finding it useful there's a bunch of industries that are using water including textiles and so on okay the question is so why why england why new common and savory and why england why coal why not firewood i mean you don't need coal to you know boil water right britain was literally running out of firewood and forests it was running out faster than most european countries uh, but britain had a different advantage which was plenty of coal in fact coal was found in several other countries in europe but not as early as britain britain apparently had even open uh, open coal pits so there was very uh, very uh, very not very deep on the surface shallow coal mines uh, were there and then once they started getting a lot of coal then they you know went after it and look for uh, deeper coal mines uh, germany and france all you know found coal too but it took them a lot lot later you know they had uh, the advantage that they had was that they had more firewood and forest to burn so they're not that desperate for coal um, so plenty of coal and so cheap and so on and I, as i said earlier uh, they really needed coal for fireplaces not just cooking it's uh, pretty miserably cold place you couldn't bathe you know you need to do, you wanted to boil water if you wanted to bathe in the winter and so on unless you want to get an arctic ice bath or what not so what what is james watt's role is he an inventor or is he really just an improver and this is something that you will find is a little bit of a both uh, you find that no most scientific inventions somebody comes along he is not really inventing it but he is improving something but some people have such a dramatic effect on what they improve that they are given credit for inventing the con the, the device uh, we'll look a little bit about his background uh, we know a little bit more about him than we do about savery or papen or people like that he is not an upper class person he was born and schooled in glasgow in scotland um he is but he was very mechanically talented his biographer describe him and contemporaries describe him as having a fortune at his finger ends that means he was very talented mechanically as a school student and they are only grammar schools uh, he loved mathematics and astronomy which are taught at that period that in fact those subjects were you know uh, the same subject astronomy to study astronomy you needed mathematics to study mathematics you studied astronomy they were taught combined uh, uh, pretty much all over the world until around us or until around the period of james watt really Uh, but they also taught latin and greek uh, kind of like india taught sanskrit or china taught mandarin or you know most of the muslim world learned arabic or persian uh, all over europe they learned latin and greek now uh, somebody like newton loved it and somebody like uh, james watt really hated this like uh, you know latin and greek but he really loved mathematics and astronomy uh, in 1755 when he was around the age of 18 uh, he was educated he was trying to get some job he wasn't very working and somebody advised him to go to london to get an apprenticeship to you know uh, learn a skill under somebody and london was one of the biggest cities in the world at that point it was getting it was it was about it was about to get much 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 bigger uh, but even in those days uh, land, tra land travel to london was considered extremely risky you took a stage or you walked uh, you took coaches and uh, you know uh, when, whenever you could uh, it was expensive or you walked which was cheap but it took a long time it took 12 days to do that today thanks to james watt steam engine and then later developments and you know petrol engines and electric engines you can do it in 6 hours uh, distance is roughly around 700 to 800 miles from the same distance i think from madras to kanyakumari or something like that roughly you were take um prayers at church should be said to people who are undertaking a trip to london in fact james watt uh, remembers that when one of his fellow uh, townsmen uh, went to decided to go to london all the members of the church gathered the church to say prayers to wish him a long you know a safe journey to go to london and he was just going by walk they probably said the same thing to james watt when he was traveling also and his main purpose to go to london was to learn apprenticeship actually he found a, he found it uh, very difficult to get an apprenticeship london had a lot of guilds and they were not uh, very open they were not very open to taking students from the rest of the uh, place they were actually not even open to Uh, students from other parts of england uh, they were all you know were a kind of close societies think of it as our own indian society where we had caste based occupations uh, we had uh, father to son you know family this all trades were taught father to son or within families and the guilds were kind of like that except that they were occupation based rather than caste based so you could argue that occupation you know caste were also kind of an occupation 
but uh, they are a different kind of society but with similar uh, you know uh, social arrangements in terms of learning skills uh, you had to pay a master to learn a skill and the master had to accept you somebody who was very good at something anything it could be uh, something like uh, being a smith being a carpenter uh, being a ship builder being a farmer you usually had to pay to learn some skill being a weaver anything and uh, finally after difficulty can you imagine today james watt one of the greatest engineers had difficulty finding a job just finding an apprenticeship just getting an internship what we call an internship finally he got one he spent a year uh, paying 20 pounds per annum that's a lot of money uh, uh, you know uh, to learn something and remember he was interested in mathematics and astronomy and he was employed as a mathematical instrument maker what is a mathematical instrument maker somebody who made instruments for astronomy and instruments that required a little bit of math little bit of mathematics uh, so uh, compasses for telling directions theodolites for surveying the land things like parallel rulers brass scales that are for weighing uh, small masses uh, very tiny things uh, you know small instruments uh, you know they are just uh, england was just kind of beginning to get into some of the smaller uh, instrument class all of europe was he would make he uh, james watt learned to make devices such as this this is a quadrant think of it as a protractor right it's a half a protractor so you do 0 to 180 degrees this is uh, 0 to 90 degrees and you have something called a sextant a lot of this were used by sailors ships ships captains and uh, sailors would use them this is an astronomical instrument people on the ground would use them as, uh, for astronomy there are simple telescopes uh, reflecting and refracting and then they would get they are getting bigger and then clocks clocks were all the rage uh this little geared equipment and you know some similar things like that were getting very popular and these are all the you know devices that they are called mathematical instruments or astronomical instruments and james watt spent a year uh, learning these things and so this really tells of the larger ecosystem in europe uh, because there was a slow scientific explosion i call it explosion but it was really slow for a couple of hundred years after around 1500 Uh, many advances uh, because of the renaissance because of trade because of interaction with the rest of the country really also some people think it is because of the collapse of collapse of the mongol empire genghis khan's empire really kind of created a, a vast scientific base uh, made travel safe and so on and uh, europe made many advances this is the period when really we had stasis in india and china both these countries went into kind of a stall around these periods and they did very little progress for a couple of hundred years around this this time uh, whereas uh, especially china india was slowing down china really completely ground to a halt um, but europe was making very significant advances and in 18th century you know all this manchester over to india and textiles and china and, and england over to china and porcelain wars so india the textile superpower and china the porcelain superpower were beaten by england uh, because of this kind of larger ecosystem James Watt went back to Glasgow and he tried to set up a business but he was not very successful uh, making some things and uh, not say, able to sell things i mean he was very good at making things but he was not able to sell them uh, so but glasgow university he knew a couple of people and uh, one of the professors there allowed him to set up a workshop and work in that uh, workshop and one day he was asked to repair a model newcomen engine remember the newcomen engine was in practical use by the time uh, and it had had been used for several years by the time and uh, james watt apparently was the first person to question why they cooling why they cooling the cylinder by you know sprinkling water on it he said you heating the cylinder and then cooling it seems very wasteful now he was able to learn how the engine worked and fixed its broken parts but the engine he still couldn't make the engine work so the model remember this is only a model this is not a full functioning newcomen engine this is just a model in the university workshop so model was uh, sent to london to get get it fixed but meanwhile medal you know what decided to make his own steam engine so this kind of practical tinkering is something that almost no engineering uh, school or college teachers know i think they do very formal lab structures but it's the tinkerers who make the difference right uh, and uh, he made vials from little you know uh, boil you know boilers from little vials and uh, pipes from hollow canes and uh, made the experiments and being somewhat brilliant you know uh, though he was not uh, theoretically brilliant uh, not considered theoretically brilliant he actually was pretty smart he discovered what is called latent heat 
And this is a portrait of Ne, you know, James Watt. This is supposed to be James Watt. This is supposed to be the Glasgow workshop. And this is the model Newcomen engine that he was trying to fix. And he couldn't. So he decided to make his own version. You can see how similar it is to the other one. Um, so what is latent heat? Latent heat is this property. They call something sensible heat. Sensible heat is, remember, thermometers are invented. So they could tell when the temperature of a heated object was being increased. So with water, we know your temperature went from zero degrees or whatever temperature it was up to 100 degrees. It would become steam. But it would become steam right, steam right away. It would just boil for a little while. While it was boiling, once it reached 100 degrees, the heat you could increase the heat, but the temperature wouldn't change at all. It would stay the same for quite a bit. So you could add it, could, the water was absorbing a lot of heat without turning into steam. It was being uh, heated water. And at a particular point, after absorbing a certain amount of heat, it would turn into steam. It would be turned into vapor, into steam. And then it would start increasing temperature. You could heat the steam up, and the steam would uh, increase in temperature. James Watt noticed by using measurements and measuring devices, he realized that water was, there is this small period uh, or this uh, phase of the water that was increasing it, the increase in temperature, increase in heat did not increase the temperature. Now, there is a person called Joseph Black who was a professor at the Glasgow University and was considered good at chemistry. So James Watt went to him and said, look, I've discovered something called latent heat. And Joseph Black said, I know, I just discovered it two years later and I wrote a paper and published it. Congratulations for rediscovering it. So, you know, if Black hadn't discovered it, latent, uh, just, you know, uh, James Watt had discovered it. Black is famous for actually also discovering carbon dioxide and the process of carbonation which was then used to carbonate. It was very, very, very useful for beer factories, right? They were brewing beer and they would carbonate beer. Uh, so he uh, was popular for in the in the breweries. Uh, so Andrew Carnegie explains latent heat this way. He says, take, and I, I'll explain this because it's kind of important. The power of steam actually comes from that, not just heated water. Uh, take 40 kilograms of water at 60 degrees Fahrenheit, add one kilogram of steam. So you're taking 40 kilograms of water, you add one kilogram of steel, 220 degrees, just 100 degrees Celsius. That's the boiling point of water. So what is the total mass of water? It becomes 41 kg, right? 40 kg of water, 1 kg of steel. So the temperature of this water will become 72 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay, it'll go from 60 to 72. So if you add at one kilogram of water at 100 degrees rather than one kilo of steam at 100 degrees, and this is where the latent heat comes up. The total would still be 41 kilogram. But it would increase only by 2 degrees. So it would go from 60 to 62. Whereas if you added 1 kilogram of steam to it into the cylinder, you would go to 72, which is an increase of 12 degrees. So this 12 degrees of additional heat that had been absorbed by the steam, which the water probably didn't absorb. And that is the thing that is. So 1 kilogram of steam at 100 degrees Celsius or 212 Fahrenheit has 5 times the latent heat of 1 kilogram of water. Uh, you can revisit it if you don't understand it the first time, but this is a, you know that's the amount of energy it's absorbing, and so the steam becomes much much more powerful than water at the same uh, temperature. So Watt then started experimenting. So he understood the power of steam, and then he, he experimented with the various aspects of steam and tried to understand all its aspects of pressure, volume, and so on. So from 1765 to 1775, he is trying to improve the steam engine. He is trying to make it work in such a way that it is more efficient than the Newcomen engine. He was trying to improve the Newcomen engine, right? Uh, he, he wants to get rid of the uh, wasteful heat process. Uh, but he didn't, he, he was not successful in business. So he had to borrow a thousand pounds from another businessman called John Roebuck. John Roebuck was another businessman who gave him a thousand pounds. And John Roebuck said, I want two thirds of the share in your company uh, or in your engine. So when you finally make an engine, and John Roebuck had faith in James Watt, and he said, when you finally make an engine that sells, which will effectively become the replacement for the Newcomen engines that are popular today, because they'll be better, um, I will get two thirds of the profits, you'll get one third of the profit, and for that time, investing a thousand pounds in your researchers. So that's a commitment that he made. Unfortunately, Roebuck's own business went bankrupt. So he was suddenly struggling. The uh, you know the supply of money got cut off. Watt couldn't uh, continue his researches you know, in, in his spare time. So what he had to do was he had to find employment. So halfway through his research, he had to struggle and find employment. Because he was mathematically skilled, he went into land surveying 
and constructing, advising and constructing canals. Um, so while he was doing this, and he had to do this for most of the 10 years, he was trying to do that. And while he was doing this, one day he met a person, another person, another industry man called Matthew Bolton, who would become his second partner. Um, Bolton was very impressed with James Watt. And then Bolton re realized that Watt was struggling because uh, Roebuck had gone out of business and could no longer invest the money. So Matthew Bolton offered a partnership and a friendship with James Watt. And to get the rights for the steam engine, he paid off uh, paid, he paid off Roebuck's uh, debts and you know decided to take the patent rights from Roebuck and became the new partner for James Watt. Now, Bolton himself was a big manufacturer, a manufacturer of many products, and China was one of those things. While he was doing this, James Watt suddenly realized he could do something, he could put something what's called an external condenser. Instead of cooling the cylinder, he could simply pipe the steam that is used, the collapse, and then push it to a separate chamber, and then cool it there, and then bring it back to the main cylinder. So that idea he got in 1769. So he started working on this. So in the meanwhile, he was working as a surveyor, and we have some details of uh, Carnegie talks about several aspects on all the canals that he worked on. Britain was uh, building canals left, right, and center. Scotland was also bringing them. All these canals were being built. The entire island of uh, uh, Britannia was building all of all of canals and dramatically improving their uh, internal navigation system. Europe already had, to some extent, of this. The Germans and the French had a better system. And India had had it for nearly 2,000 years, from Mauryas to Guptas to Pallavas to Pandyas, all these other kingdoms, all these other Indians have been, you know, have built up an extensive network of navigational canals in India. But England was only getting this in the 18th century. They are playing, they had small canals here and there, but the entire nation was getting connected with canals only in the 18th century, which is ironic because in the 19th century, all the canals will become obsolete and be replaced substantially with railway lines and James Watt. But James Watt worked on the, uh, as a railway engineer, as a, as a canal surveyor, uh, long before railways came along. He also worked on bridges. They're not very large bridges. He was uh, working on bridges and he was, we don't know how much he was paid. He was, pound 30, he was paid 37 pounds for designing a bridge, not building the bridge, but designing the bridge. He was uh, paid 400 pounds for, uh, or dollars for you know, designing the Perth Canal and so on. He was also designing things like docks and piers. So multi-talented person, fortune at his finger ends, he was doing all these other jobs. And as I said, this is there of canals. The canals were not very big. You know, look at this one. There's a very long boat. It's a very small, very narrow canal. Uh, it's barely wider than this, you know. Our Buckingham Canal in Madras is about four times as wide as this. But they were very useful. And a lot of canals were not machine-powered. A lot of the boats were not machine-powered, but they were horse-drawn. They were not necessarily also overpowered. We'd have a horse on the shore tied a rope to the mast of the canal and it would pull it. And it was so efficient because water was pulling the, because of water, uh, the energy, energy needed to pull the uh, load was much lower. And so that's one of the reasons why they were doing this. They even built these things, right? They put bridges over rivers. So you had a river here, and you had a uh, viaduct or an aqueduct over a river, and you, you occasionally have a sailing boat to capture the wind also, but uh, a lot of these boats were, you know, they, they're building an extraordinary transportation system Horse drawn, not on the land, but on the water for moving large, bulky loads. Um, so let's come back to James Watt. So because of, uh, once he met uh, Bolton and uh, resumed the you know, process of research, uh, which had to be suspended because uh, Robert got bankrupt and his funding got disrupted, uh, he's found out that uh, the biggest problem was the cylinder structure and the cylinder's uh, stability. So he had, and the, pack, the piston also, uh, metallurgy was not all that great at that point. So packing the piston was one of the big problems, uh, making sure that the cylinder didn't collapse because of leaks and all that. Le the leaking cylinder was not very helpful. So they, he tried to come up with all kinds of filling materials. Apparently he tried with cork, with oil rags, old hats, paper, even horse dung, patching all the cylinders with all of this. But meanwhile, in that environment, there was another engineer called John Wilkinson, who was making better cylinders? He was more of a smith than uh, and a boat maker than anything else. And he was working with metal. John Wilkinson is famous for cladding boats with uh, metal sheets so that the uh, wooden boats wouldn't crash on the seas. Even remember, England a, became a naval superpower. 
but there there is a big problem of uh, you know hitting reefs and rocks and damaging them so they came up with the idea of uh, you know putting metal large metal sheets on the boats so they wouldn't uh, you know uh, have an entire ship sink simply because it crashed to the rock but they needed good metal for that so metallurgy was something that was some you know, on, uh, you know other people were working also and john wilkinson was seems to have been a master at metallurgy and he got, and he, including things like uh, finding you know finding the right alloys combining it making iron stronger making iron sheets uh, stronger building cylinders inventing a boring machine for the cylinder making better cylinders so there was mutual help john wilkinson watered better cylinders uh, he was providing you know he so he made them he pro he could provide the better cylinder and when he made the cylinder which watt bought and then when watt created engine out of it john wilkinson was one of his first customers he bought several of james watt's engines so you know very mutual relationship so this is kind of very interesting uh, this is bolton and watt this is matthew bolton and this is james watt uh until recently england did not put anybody except their royals so only kings and queens would adorn the face of their currency but in the last few years they have put a lot of their uh, giants like newton and darwin and uh, uh, such people adam smith and so on and uh, on the 50 pound note the bank of england has issued walton and Bo you know bolton and watt as the currency note so i thought that was very interesting so uh, i'm sharing this picture this is an extraordinary business partnership most of us hear about james watt we rarely hear about uh, matthew bolton so what was matthew bolton's story bolton was a manufacturer of toys what we call toys today are different from what people call the use the word for in the 18th century in the 18th century bolton was manufacturing things like buttons and belt buttons for shirts and you know clothing buckles candlesticks these are all called toys you know this is the kind of thing you would find in your standard singapore plaza or whatever any uh, any fancy store this is the kind of thing that they were making and he was manufacturing them uh, cups and jars plating jewelry people were interested in all kinds of new things they had discovered electro plating uh, you know so people were a lot of very interested in silver plating and copper plating the things to make them shiny look them you know people were conscious of social status they wanted their houses to look better getting into better interior decor and all that. but uh, he, his customers were not just you know the average london citizen but also royalty and nobility uh, matthew bolton apparently was making swords and he had two very important customers prince edward and prince george one of them would go on to become the king of england uh, a royal family he made vases uh, for charlotte queen charlotte i think of france and one of his most uh, favorite pet Uh, patrons in fact uh, somebody who was a big customer was the uh, lady tsar of russia she was not a tsar then but uh, you know catherine of russia uh, she later became the empress of the tsar of russia and she actually visited his workshop and she was a house guest at bolton imagine a very rich person uh, getting rich manufacturing all these little things that people are buying left right and center uh, you know because uh, london was urbanizing it was getting refined it was becoming uh, england was becoming european uh, and people were buying a lot of these household goods and royal families and large very rich families are also interested in some of the objects that they made it, made and they were even interested in some of the manufacturing process so uh, imagine today you know like our factory visits from uh, royalty or presidents and prime minister politicians so bolton set up a factory a manufactory Uh, this is the factory where he was manufacturing all of this okay um so this is the famous soho manufactory where he was making all of these things these are just uh, samples of things that i was showing he was also minting metal so a lot of metal work uh, organized mass production kind of thing and uh, here's a very interesting aspect to the story england was not thought of as a country with a good manufacturing base at that point in fact france was considered better right the french were yet to uh, suffer the industry the french revolution and a bunch of other things that happened uh, in the meanwhile england would take over but such a poor reputation did england have for manufacturing that bolton would make things in his soho manufactory but people wouldn't buy things if they were simply you know made by this was in his early days later on once he started uh, getting royal customers that changed so what he would do is what he apparently did was literally send things that he manufactured 
across to France and then bring them back, you know, in a different ship or the same ship back to the port and then bring them back. You know, this sounds unbelievably stupid, but he had to do that because then when, you know, when he brought the goods to his store, uh, he could give them, you know, uh, he could say they were manufactured in France, even though they are manufactured locally. Can you imagine things like this? You manufacture something, then you send it to France and bring it back, pretending it is manufactured in France, because then people will think import quality, high quality, and French brand is considered superior. And that is when he started set up from a smaller, smaller factory to a larger manufacturer, he set it up. And then, uh, you know, once he started getting uh, famous royal customers, his sales massively improved. And like I said, Prince Edward and George, this George would become the George III, famous for clashing with, uh, uh, you know, the, tax, the tea tax on America and then losing that empire and, you know, all kinds of other things. Um, there's even a movie about him, I think. Um, so his sales improved greatly uh, and then made in England become a major fact. In fact, Catherine of Russia was a huge voice. And she apparently said, uh, uh, Bolton's manufactories are better than the French. And so his reputation really took a huge, uh, huge uh, positive impact. Uh, the, I couldn't help remarking uh, the Indian situation today. We buy clothes like uh, Peter England and Van Heusen and Calvin Klein, even though the England came to India to buy our textiles and went back. And I don't know how many of all these Peter England brands are made in Tirupur and then just get all these uh, European brand names, whereas they are all considered apparently superior to local brand, brand names like this. This is literally what uh, you know Bolton was going through in his time. So Catherine, and this is another interesting aspect, Catherine offered James Watt 5,000 pounds a year to move to Russia. Remember, he was struggling to build, uh, you know, get money. His, his partner had collapsed and all that. That period, she offered him 5,000 pounds to move to Russia. But uh, since Bolton was, had talked about Watt and Bolton was suddenly terrified. You know, my partner is uh, likely to go to Russia because the king, the queen of Russia is offering um, because Watt was struggling. But Bolton man, somehow managed to persuade Watt to stay in uh, in England, and Watt agreed. And Watt was also feeling patriotic; he wanted to do something for his country, so he decided to stay behind. Uh, I remember reading Edison's biography, and Edison also had such a very strange moment uh, because he was uh, in his telegraphy days; uh, he was struggling uh, for money, and uh, the, the Abraham Lincoln's war, the Civil War in America, was happening. Uh, at a very crucial period of Edison's life. So Edison wanted to leave America and go to a safer place. He really literally considered uh, going to Brazil. But uh, one gentleman, he was, uh, he, actually, uh, he was about to board a ship in New Orleans heading to Brazil. And then one, uh, one gentleman there at the harbor uh, convinced him to go to you know, search his fortune in New York instead. Uh, imagine Edison had uh, you know, invented uh, his light bulb in America, uh, in Brazil, or that James Watt had gone to Russia and the steam engine came from Russia. Uh, many a slip between history and what really happened. So let's come back to Watt and his struggles. Watt had, unfortunately, Watt had a lot of good friends like uh, Joseph Black, Professor Robinson, who gave him the workshop. Uh, in the meanwhile, God, Watt had gotten married, had two children. Unfortunately, his wife died. So he had, uh, you know, he had the pressure of bringing up his children without a wife and trying to, you know, go on a job that took him all over Scotland and England, uh, you know, trying to do land surveys and canals. He was, uh, Watt was not a born a rich person. He never made much money. And in, in those times, there was something called debtors' prisons in England. This was abolished only about 100 years later. Okay. And Watt's greatest fear uh, was of borrowing money and going to a debtors' prison. Uh, if you couldn't pay your debt, uh, you could go to jail and there's no way of, you know, coming out of uh, debtors prison without somebody else paying the money to pay your debt. And you could, you know, die in prison. Prisons were not very healthy at that time. So he was absolutely terrified of debtors prisons and wouldn't take uh, money. And today's IPO world, uh, this seems, you know, people are throwing money at anybody who even has a half a half-baked idea. And one of the greatest engineers of all time was terrified of borrowing money to improve the steam engine because he was terrified that he couldn't pay it and go into prison. Um, but that's not the other only thing he had. He even learned German because he wanted to understand uh, better things, you know, better things about furnaces and mine work. And apparently somebody told him the German, Germans are the ones doing the best work on it. So he learned German to read a German book. Can you imagine doing that today? A book called Theatrim Machinarum. It was in German. So he learned German. Uh, though he hated Latin and Greek, he learned German to do this. 
So after several years of struggles, and I'm not going into the engineering technical struggles, that's probably a different because I'm focusing more on the history of this. After 10 years, he managed to get a great success. His biggest invention or his biggest insight is really what is called the external condenser. And he had this insight apparently in 1769. And he filed a patent for the external condenser and got a patent for it. So he identified that the biggest inefficiency of the Newcomen steam engine was cooling the cylinder for each piston cycle. Why are you cooling it each time? You're heating, cooling, heating, cooling. That's extraordinary inefficient. Today, it seems obvious. In his time, apparently, it didn't because that was the model for 70 years, right? 1692, uh, uh, 1698 was uh, um, uh, Savery's engine. And for 70, 73 years, they were using that model. And uh, until what decided to come up with the external condenser. Uh, so he used, if you use a steam to pipe it out to the external condenser, the cylinder won't need cooling and reheating. So you can do that uh, cycle faster. That was his idea. But the problem was that steam pressure was a problem. The, you know, that he had help from Wilkinson and a couple of other engineers who were trying to get it better. And finally, he got it working so that it would explode or leak or destroy it. So it took him six years to get the uh, metallurgy and the heat manufacture the, and the you know efficiency and all that mechanics all of it right so he finally was able to get a successful model and he filed a patent for it you know but now what happened was the 1769 patent, patent would have expired in about 12 years Bo bolton being a brilliant businessman and having a lot of connections with royals and parliamentarians uh, managed to persuade british parliament he didn't go to the patent office he went to parliament and parliament apparently passed passed to some order. I don't know what they did. They put a passed a governor order, or government order, passed the law, what he did. He managed to get the patent extended for 25 years. Remember the 25 years that Savery got uh, uh, 70 years earlier, he got the same courtesy. And that was Bolton. And this is one of the key contributions that Bolton made. I think uh, that was you know very success, you know, instrumental in what succeeding with this engine and the engine getting adopted. So this is really the model. So you had the cylinder. This is kind of like the Newcomen engine. The only difference, you can see that the picture and everything is very similar to the water pump. The only difference is this little external condenser where the steam you know, is rerouted to that and then it comes back to that. That's the big, uh, massive, visibly different uh, improvement over the Newcomen engine. So uh, this is kind of, this, uh, kind of a good insight, I think. Uh, the Papin engine versus the Newcomen engine. Uh, to the Papin engine, of course, just theoretical. We don't know if it worked. It's just a piston on the cylinder. The Newcomen engine had a separate boiler and all that. And the external condenser was the big difference in Watt's engine. This is this shot is from a, a picture that I took in uh, the Smithsonian Museum in America, American History Museum. So, but that was not the only major change he made. He made a, several things. One. Uh, once you made this external condenser, you didn't need the atmospheric pressure to collapse the engine anymore. So you could make it a closed cylinder. So you don't need to cool it. So you're solving two problems at the time. It's a, so it's a proper steam engine. It's a steam engine where steam is doing the work rather than atmospheric pressure. So that's why Newcomen's engine and Savery's engine are called atmospheric engines. Whereas what is given credit for discovering the steam engine, though really he improved the Newcomen engine. It's a fully closed cylinder. And he used a circular cylinder. Some of the earlier ones are apparently square. And in fact, the tea kettle legend comes from the kettle-shaped boiler that was earlier used by Newcomen. And uh, people wanted some kind of popular story. And the story goes that it is James Watt's son, uh, also called James Watt Jr., who really spread the settle, you know, the rumor of that uh, uh, James Watt, his father, watched the tea kettle boil. And that story became popular because everybody could understand it. It's a great story for a newspaper. People like you know people can relate to tea much better than an external condenser or latent heat. So that story became popular. What happened after that? The year he built it, he was able to sell 65 engines. Or 65 engines were ordered by all kinds of customers. And in about 15 years, they would improve to uh, 500 engines. So he went from so the problem though is that they are not mass manufacturing the engines. Each engine had to be built, you know, individually by James Watt. And uh, mine owners who were using Newcomen engines that were buying Newcomen engines canceled orders for Newcomen engines because they could see clearly see that Watt's engine was better. They were ordering uh, 
Watts engines. So the people buying the old Newcomen engines are replacing them with James Watts engines. Not only that, uh, companies that are using horses for uh, doing certain work, like drawing grinding machines, horses were used to draw mills. Mills are these very large uh, stone things that would crush grain and so on. And uh, beer is brewed from, and several alcohols are brewed from grain. So they are really millers uh, who crush the grain and then they would, uh, you know, uh, make it ferment and put it in liquid and, you know, water and sugar and make it ferment and all that. So they realized that they could harness this James Watt steam engine uh, to drive the engine instead of using just horsepower to make the, you know, uh, mill grind round and round. So James Watt came up with the concept of how many horses his engine would replace. And that's where the measure of horsepower came as a measure of engine power. Okay. So this is the thing. And Whitbread, Whitbread's Brewery, one of the local breweries, was the first one to replace the horse with a steam engine. But remember, what, what had to do was that he had to do on stage. There was no manufacturing plant. It's not like a car factory. It's not like a uh, you know, refrigerator factory or something that we are accustomed to today. The each engine, only the cylinder could be built at this foundry. The entire engine had to be assembled on site. It would probably be in a building. It would probably be in a mine. It would be in a foundry, in a smith place, or a, or, or a brewery, or whatever it was. So Watt personally had to go to all these places, uh, assemble the engines, along with the pump, the frame, and all that stuff. Imagine if 100 years uh, later, Thomas Edison, uh, or somebody, anybody today, imagine if uh, you know uh, Google or Amazon or somebody, instead of making the uh, you know, com you know, computers at the local, you know, or ma making the server or whatever it is, at their central factory, had to go on site to install all of these things. It, and but they personally had to go to, they couldn't sell as engineers. The problem with James Watt was he couldn't find many engineers. So that was his problem. We'll come to that a little later. Um, engineers then, so uh, the business model, which I think is probably an insight of Bolton rather than Watt, was that the engines measured in horsepower, and the way they charge money was by uh, charging it, you know, the business model was you pay one third of the money saved by not using horses. So if you are a mill or a brewery that was using 18 horses to grind all your uh, 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 thing, and then the engine replaced all the 18 horses, then you would pay the cost of six horses. You're only paying one third uh, of the horse, because you know if you pay the full thing, you'd rather use the horses. So the payment is not for the engine itself, but as a portion of what the steam engine, the cost that the steam engine was replacing. Okay. And the similar model came up with for people who are replacing the Newcomen engine. The Newcomen engine was inefficient. The Watts engine was much more efficient. So it was using coal much more effectively. You needed far less coal. So the business model, if you replace the Newcomen engine, was you paid one third of the money saved in coal use. So the money was not paid to install the uh, entire steam engine, but to operate the steam engine. They were paying a royalty for operating the steam engine. And the fee was determined as coal use cost. So if a Newcomen engine used a thousand pounds of coal and the Watt engine was doing the same work for only 400 pounds of coal. You could say kilograms or tons or whatever you want instead of coal, uh, instead of pounds, because pounds is the weight of measure, not the money. Then you pay the price for you say it's 600 pounds, right? You paid 600 pounds. So you pay the price of 600 pounds or 200 pounds of coal, which is one third of the difference that you made. And that's a very interesting business model. When we study you know, engineering, we rarely study things like business model, pricing model, and all that. That's all pre compartmentalized into business school, accounting, and so on. But a person who runs a business has to come up with a way to you know um, measure what is uh, value that is, is instrument or device or business is providing and i think this is a very good way to understand it uh, so i thought this is an important thing to include in a lecture about uh, james watts engine and what is the business model of selling the engine what was it replacing what was the advantage to the manufacturer what was the adv advantage to the customers who are buying these engines and how were they replacing it and it's easy enough to understand Notice that they still don't have any railway engine. This is just a stationary engine, right? The locomotive engine is far and far in the future. So you, suddenly the landscape of England uh, was littered with steam factories because uh, Newcomen's engines were not being used for by factories for manufacturing. 
they were not used being by mills they were not used by textile things they were only used in coal mines and certain foundries okay and metal workers but james watt's engine started getting into new markets like uh, all the others in the, even in even matthew bolton's own uh, manufacturing plant started using harnessing the power of steam engine even to improve his manufacturing manufacturing of any any metal any power right so you can see that in this early stage transportation is still by horse drawn carriages but stationary engines are powering all these other things so what are plants foundries you know things like that are being used and so there's a huge amount of coal uh, being burned and powering uh, you know, stationary factories you had horse drawn coal wagons because the coal still had to be bought from there the coal was not bought in trains it was bought in trains but in small wagons that were pulled by horses and this is what eventually what would lead to the idea of uh, replacing the horse with the mobile steam engine that had to wait uh, trevithick and uh, stevenson to come up with those inventions okay what did the what are the difficulties faced by james watt major uh, biggest was employee poaching uh, which is something i think everybody in the software industry and most industries would recognize today um other companies that try to set up and try to get his employees you know try to tempt away his employees were a big problem industrial spice france germany all these countries wanted to buy this because they thought of selling the engine, selling selling them all steam engines and those countries actually you didn't sell them early on and then later on he sold them he, he was first was giving power to um the british industry and then french agents and german agents you know serious industrial spying was going on they are trying to lure workers you know just like catherine of russia tried to lure james watt himself uh, some of the uh, the biggest problem of course was he engine was designed separately and uh, watt had to go to each place and uh, uh, you know install this things install these engines and last but not least is a cost is a, a problem that everybody who's ever run a business or rented a house or what not would recognize so the customers wouldn't pay or disputed savings and all that now james watt if he had tried to do this he would have gone nuts it was only uh, matthew bolton who really uh, kind of helped him with it and bought a bunch you know bought his business talents to it and was really helpful so the partnership was not just business uh, watt married a second time he married uh, another lady in 1776 a year after he started selling this thing remember his first wife died a few years earlier so the father he needed permission from the father in law and his business partner actually wrote a recommendation letter to the uh, prospect to father in law saying what was a trust, respectable person is a decent person and all that stuff. so the brother in law apparently objected so the lady whom he married the second time brought a huge dowry and that uh, her brother was not very keen on uh, but anyway um, so the good thing about bolton was that he had gone through it too his first wife had died and he married his uh, first wife mary's sister and uh, who was uh, you know sister, uh, their cousins too and this was uh, kind of illegal apparently in the church uh, in england where bolton uh, was a congregationer but it was legal under the common law if you didn't want to get married in that church and bolton what he did was he did a simple thing he went to scotland where nobody knew either of them and uh, he was able to marry his uh, you know his wife his sister in law Uh, in scotland on the church and and so he also advised matt uh, he, he didn't need an advice uh, what was actually from scotland himself but the advice was to get uh, you know uh, marry in scotland uh, where it was uh, much more lenient apparently and you don't have social uh, scorn so this is the kind of uh, not just business partnership but also a personal friendship uh, uh, that was really a part of their thing and bolton's big contribution and we can't talk about what what we were talking about bolton was uh, really got to getting rid of what's terrified nightmare the great nightmare of the fear of debt what's real fear was going to debtors prison bolton was a business genius and he was calm and wonderful in the crisis it's really what you need in a businessman and uh, carnegie says this repeatedly carnegie's biography on this uh, brings a very interesting perspective because carnegie himself is from scotland he went to america he went as a you know very small poor person and became the head of one of the largest corporations in the world us steel and uh, talks about you know importance of bolton importance of partnership importance of friendship is business sense carnegie was uh, you know much better businessman than uh, you know he, he was more a businessman than an engineer and he so talks about this aspect of it what would have therapy would have probably failed badly without bolton as a partner or without the technology of wilkinson's iron cylinder 
or brilliant assistants like murda uh, he had a what had a bottom bottom had a premier assistant called murda who was very very good in fact he was one of probably the best assistant he had and uh, whenever what couldn't go to install an engine the problem another problem that i forgot to mention was alcoholism uh, they could hire a lot of people but a uh, lot of people lot of the engineers the uh, iron smiths the foundry workers the steam uh, workers they were very very fond of alcohol alcohol addiction was a huge problem all over uh, england and uh, that was something that uh, the bolton watt company struggled with a lot uh, they could not get stable employees who could not get drunk talented people were few and far between and they were all uh, afflicted with uh, and um, watt apparently didn't drink so that was a big strength of his but watt didn't stop with just the engine that was that he made he started making improvements to it so this is where his you know he really comes in as an engineer and shows you know he's not satisfied with just a successful business model he keeps improving year after year he came with something called the double acting engine which worked on both the downward and the upward and the downward stroke remember that the uh, watt engine has a piston that the steam engine steam would push up on the upward stroke and then the steam would then the you know once the steam was pushed out through the valve the engine would the, the piston would come down but he may managed to come up with a double acting engine where both were working came up with what's called a rotary engine uh, what's original engine had a crankshaft design which is uh, familiar with more, and i'll show a picture of what a crankshaft is and uh, you know but now this crankshaft design was stolen by one of his own employees who went to another company and those guys copied it and filed a patent for it uh, so this is the industrial espionage problem that he had so what had to come up with the the design but the rotary the, the uh, you know what you call the up and down motion the linear motion of the piston had to be trans translated into a rotary motion to operate a wheel so once you could do a wheel that is what uh, some an industry like a brewery or a textile mill found useful the straight up and down motion was not useful that was fine for mines which pump water or fines for foundries which are uh, pounding metal you know uh, using using it as uh, you know pressing metal but it was not very good for uh, other engines so what came up with the different design he called it the sun and planet gear so this is other thing that is the rotary engine model that he came up with and that this time he patented it and third was something called the compound engine where you could get two engines running side by side and both powering the same device so that two engines working together is another thing so these are all extraordinary improvements to uh, basic engine design newcomer didn't seem to doesn't seem to have done you know this kind of work and this is one of the this is these are the reasons that what really deserves today not only for inventing the steam engine but also improving the steam engine so here's this is what this is here's your what steam engine this is the furnace there's the coil this is the condenser and all that and here you see the you know sun and planet gear and uh, this is a classroom model that i found in the american museum i just wanted to show it and you can see kind of the crankshaft model over here right this is the lever this is the piston this is the steam engine this is the external condenser over here it's operating a lever and there it is it's powering this wheel um this is the crank and flywheel model that you are familiar with right so the crank actually attaches to a one of the spokes in the wheel and because of it's got like a you know there's a small shaft of a very varying length of a different length here that ties to from the eccentric from the center of this wheel to a bolt or a nut you know that comes from this other operating lever and so what will happen is that up and down motion of that will turn into a rotary motion of the wheel here because of this shaft that's called the crank shaft so because this was stolen crank could you know what couldn't use it so he came up with the design of a sun and planet gear where you had remember he has the astronomical training so that he understood the orbital model so you would have a central toothed wheel around the center of the wheel and then the shaft would have a secondary wheel which is also a gear and so this uh, gear operated like a planet gear so this is like the sun and this is like the planet and it's orbiting around the central uh, you know gear here and this also translates the uh, up and down motion of this uh, particular you know, up and down motion of this piston into rotary motion of this wheel and this is critically important for a lot of industries okay and this is the model of the uh james watt engine that i uh, let take a picture of here you can see the crankshaft here um, you know here over here this is the crankshaft this is the engine this is the crankshaft model you it's an incomplete picture but i think you can get the idea i would really urge you to go look at uh, uh, the powerpoint uh, presentation or just a few pictures don't give you a full model 
there are some excellent videos out there there are demonstrations there are pictures uh, uh, you know more detailed articles and so on i would really urge you to go out there and see some of them i'll share them in our whatsapp group and perhaps on facebook group. so what happens after that the impact of the steam engine uh, we'll talk a little bit about this historical aspect steam powered industries really took off once um, uh, james watts engine was adopted um, water pumps and mines were the first uh, this thing coal iron and tin mines uh, you could pump out far more water faster they became far more productive you could go deeper in these mines and so the mines mines themselves could could deeper the process became much cheaper uh, and it kind of got an auto catalytic uh, cycle because you was using far less coal uh, far more coal could be mined and used for other things you know you needed far less coal uh, and you could mine far more coal and you could make more iron more tin and so on metal foundries became major customers presses and forges powered by steam so you could make bigger and you know more powerful things the engine itself was more powerful i uh, and so on more efficient you could do things cheaper that was a huge huge factor lower costs and higher power textile mills which could not use the earlier they were powered by water wheels uh, based on uh, mills and so on water mills and uh, you know uh, water wheels and so on and uh, windmills also were used earlier but suddenly textile means the textile revolution is a very another interesting story that also happened in the during the time of james watt uh, there was a huge revolution first in france and then in england over 40 years england made dramatic improvements in the textile industry which you won't go into it's a whole other talk by itself earlier these were powered by water wheels the industrialization of uh, textile manufacturing really happened in england and these were earlier powered by water wheels uh and the steam engines uh, before what even the early steam they were literally used to pump back water into the and so you know you power the wheels but uh, another person called richard arkwright uh, bought the rotary steam engine from james watt and then instead of using the you know steam engine to pump back water and power the water wheel he decided to uh, power the machines themselves uh, using uh, the rotary engine and then the whole system of gears and other mechanisms they you know uh, to spin the things all that happened and uh, but the engines were still stationary until 1800 which is when james watt's patent expired the engines 102 years after same savery's first patent the engines were still stationary they were not mobiles there is no railways okay and in fact the 25 year patent became kind of a bugbear because nobody else could invent a separate steam engine without infringing on watt's uh, patent and watt and bolton sat on the patent and try to that was not easy for them they paid 30000 pounds remember they are charging a few hundred pounds for each engine but they had to play a london pay london solic- solicitors lawyers uh, so the lawyers who whether the bolton and watt got rich or not i mine you know the mine make the miners and the metal foundries and the other manufacturing industries the textile mills all of these people got rich but the lawyers also got rich um, in that period because they were the ones who were going after people who were trying to copy the engine you know enforcing patent rights and so on and uh, um, they were apparently worth the money in pay because uh, um, um, james watt reports paying 30000 pounds to a solicitor firm uh, in fees lawyers fees and uh, and in fact what in his later days uh, used the phrase london solicitors fees when he meant extortion you know very lar- very large fee he used the phrase so these are the power spindles that uh, you know you can see all of these rotating spinning threads you know uh, this kind of stuff that uh, the kind of manufacturing that was enabled uh, by james watt steam engine was this the rotary engine was this there were limitations Uh, what had to be the installer himself alcoholism was a big problem heat smoke and health problems were there it is still substantially an individual based uh, enterprise there is no mass manufacturing of engines standardization of tools were not there but all these happened in the 20 years that the steam engine was developing so this the literally an another uh, revolution that the manufacturing revolution and standardization revolution was happening uh, that was kind of triggered by uh, not just by what but also the metallurgical changes the demands of the market that were happening at that time uh, meanwhile metallurgy was also improving uh, steel they're not didn't have very good steel at that point they were still using cast iron and uh, 
uh, even wrought iron was not uh, you know in, in 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 popular thing high pressure was a big problem a lot of the cylinders could not so um what engines as important as they were and as uh, substantially better than they were the newcomer engines were still low pressure engines compared to what was possible but uh, the quality of the steel the quality of all of this had to improve and literally that happened another 50 years later with another british engineer called henry bessemer who came up with a better uh, steel manufacturing process meanwhile somebody like a uh, person called richard trevithick uh, managed to come up with uh, better high pressure engines uh, and that had to wait until watt and boltons patent expired before high pressure engines could become popular so while watt was uh, james watt's engine was responsible for launching this industrial revolution it was also responsible for holding back its progress for a few years so the patents that he uh, expired the most famous patent of course was the patent for the steam engine with the external condenser which expired in 1775 but bolton lobbied and extended it to 1800 and this this is what i just mentioned um, we had an earlier version of what i called open source where a person called john lean came up with other designs and uh, these were also you know people were making them uh, in privately and secretly a uh, major aspect of watt's life was that Ah, his collaborators, excuse me, his collaborators, besides Matthew Bolton, whose house became sort of the meeting place of a society called the Lunar Society, and the Lunar Society had very fascinating participants like Benjamin Franklin, the American uh, inventor, freedom fighter, and uh, you know journalist, postmaster, who was uh, appointed as postmaster general of uh, Philadelphia to England, and eventually postmaster of. america to england he was living in england he was one of the collaborators erasmus darwin who was a doctor and the grandfather of the famous charles darwin uh, joseph black who had discovered carbon dioxide and latent heat william small professor robinson who was the one who helped uh, uh, what set up the workshop in glasgow josiah wedgwood who would become another major manufacturer uh, major you know brilliant uh, parliamentarian uh, brilliant you know amazing uh, entrepreneur joseph priestley who discover amazing things about oxygen carbon dioxide and refuse to believe them uh, talked about various airs the biology of air the collaborator he went to france and collaborated with antoine lavoisier taught lavoisier certain things you know one of the most brilliant persons to ever live all of these people were part of and i'm leaving out a few names but the lunar society operated on a monthly basis they would meet on the night of the full moon in mostly in bolton's house sometimes in darwin's house and other places they would meet there and then they had discussions this is an alternate to the royal society where people like uh, newton and boyle and uh, uh, even uh, uh, hook robert hook and others had uh, met a previous earlier which was also parallelly functioning and some of these guys would also become members of the royal society later so these people were considered the fathers of the industrial revolution uh, not only uh, um, james watt because parallelly lavoisier was discovering a whole new uh, world of chemistry helped by people like uh, priestley and black and others and so there is a huge revolution going on so that would have launched another aspect of the industrial revolution what i talked about the external condenser but what made a lot of little improvements to the engine and there are some of these are his own innovations there are something called a throttle valve so you had to up and down you know kind of an accelerator and decelerator kind of uh, thing so he came up with something is called a throttle valve he came up with something called the governor a governor is a kind of a mechanism mechanical mechanism that stabilizes the pace of the engine the, you know they are, they had limited limited control over the amount of heat that they were generating so they wanted to uh, control the rotational speed of the uh, rotary uh, the wheels that they were powering and that was done using a very interesting device called the governor uh, we would sometimes we should sometimes in, you know get a mechanic maybe badri can talk maybe Uh, professor swamina can talk about it. some mechanics you can talk about governors or probably some perhaps somebody in the industry who could talk about it so he invented a lot of steam gauges to measure the pressure of steam you know so all these little devices that he came up with then came up with steam you know pressure indicators so people could monitor the pressure or the monitor the temperature all of these little devices had to be invented so these are all part of the uh, steam engine improvements that what was making what had to make so all of these improvements are also uh, part of uh, his contribution he came up with something called a screw propeller 
which is kind of the large propeller that would later be powered by steam engines anybody saw titanic you saw that huge propellers that are uh, you know powered by that engines so those propellers that model he came up with though he didn't actually implement it he came up with the design but he didn't implement it okay this is like dennis papin's uh, steam engine he came up with an improved gas lamp and of course humphrey day would come along a little later and do a better one this to me is one of the most fascinating machines what james watt actually invented a copying machine and he sold about 150 of them this is a precursor to the xerox copy machine that we have today i didn't even know that he could do it electric you know before the age of uh, uh, photography and before the age of that but apparently uh, you know uh, he did invent one he invented a copying machine in 1778 sold about 150 in his lifetime but they were not very profitable unlike the steam engine which was extremely profitable the james watt model of the copying machine was actually in use for 100 years before uh, later models came along especially the 20th century with xerox and photocopy machine he even invented a kind of an arithmetic machine but didn't finish it he even started working designing on a sculpture copying machine so three dimensional machine that it would and you know these are all stories that i find utterly fascinating what did he do what what are what what are these inventions you know i love to hear i hope we had some other uh, future day we get some lecture by somebody who is an expert on this these matters this is a picture i found uh, on the internet about watts copying press i can't imagine i can't even imagine how this thing works uh, but there it is and uh, since it's not well known and it fascinated me i thought i'd share it with you uh, so when he died uh, which he did you know very he lived in the well into his 70s uh, in fact one of his sons predeceased him uh, when he finally when he died on a, he was buried in a church in uh, scotland i believe and uh, when he died the chemist an english newspaper came up with a very interesting um, obituary and this, this paragraph which i take from andrew carnegie's book is i think very fitting he, they called him an unintentional benefactor different from a lot of people want to improve society right we want to do things we think of somebody like gandhi or mother teresa or you know somebody who an you know, abraham lincoln or somebody like that you know wants to improve society or jonas sark or somebody like that you think of these people as public benefactors or large donors and all these people right social servant he is different from other public benefactors by never having made or pretended to making this goal to benefit the public he only wanted to make a better steam engine he wanted to sell it he wanted to make a profit he was a businessman who wanted to make money no pretensions of improving society at large but but this unpretending man conferred more benefit to the world than all those who for centuries made it their special business to look after public welfare so people who said you know whether the religious people or you know philosophers philosophers or public well doers or philanthropists you know thinkers uh, moral uh, guardians you know whatever you want to call them people who are doing uh, people who build hospitals doctors uh, social servants all of these people you know liberators all of this james watt they think conferred more benefit to the world than all for centuries made it their special business to look after public welfare it's a very interesting phrase um and uh, andrew carnegie also talks about how much power um james watts engine uh, provided and the uh, copies of the engine and he talks about his time when steam engines were still in use and the diesel engine and petrol engine had not replaced them and mass in about 1904 when the book was written by andrew carnegie carnegie says the installed capacity of the world at that point if you measured it not in horsepower but in human power physical manual labor uh, he talks about uh, 150 million horsepower or something like that right so some huge number he talks about and the number doesn't matter but he thinks if people were to do the work of all the steam engines that are being used when he was writing the book in 1904 100 years after born, uh, james watt had died andrew carnegie says 100 years after james watt had died the amount of steam power being used by that it is about eight times the uh, you know manual power that adult men could provide if they are physically working 
for most of history the largest amount of physical powerful labor was provided by either men or horses bulls and animals like that but if manual labor had not been replaced by steam how many men could would, would it need in 1904 to power all the factories if you could power them with humans and he says there aren't enough humans you would need eight times the adult males to do it and i by adult males he means people between 20 and about 50 or so and they are still in somewhat good physical condition so there's a lot of this thing i won't go into that and the successors to what are people like richard trevithick trevithick had a brilliant insight he said uh, his insight was that the condenser is not necessary he said why are you cooling the steam it's not needed you can make a high pressure uh, steam engine you can do it and you can do it with a higher power to a weight weight ratio the steam engine could be made such so small a self driving steam engine was possible and that would be the idea for a locomotive it was considered by what a model was made by what so it was not outside what's idea but what was extraordinarily skeptical about high pressure he thought high pressure would kill people it was very dangerous this uh, reminded me of edison's uh, uh, you know animosity towards alternative current there's a famous battle between edison and tesla or even westinghouse uh, which about which sivaraman talked about earlier last year when he talked about westinghouse uh, edison skepticism of alternating current as dangerous to human beings and what had the same skepticism of high pressure uh, but uh, trevithick nevertheless went around and made it but uh, he was very he was somewhat successful and he launched it and after trevithick came george stevenson but that's a different story uh, perhaps i can uh, share it with uh, the mara mera science forum at a future date um so these are my sources my primary source was james watt the biography by andrew carnegie if you don't have the book i urge you to get it uh, uh, i think it's free on kindle or you can even buy it now it's in print um another book that helped me understand it was creating the 20th century by vashlav smil uh, there is a youtube series called industrial revelations it's a fantastic series i seriously urge you to watch that series a couple of pictures i have taken or snapshots from that uh, thing then wikipedia of course had a lot of excellent articles there are other videos and uh, different uh, other uh, websites on the internet a couple of other books i won't mention so all kinds of these things so these are the sources that i had um uh, i write about some of the stuff in my blog i one of the to me discovering that james watt's major contribution to the external condenser was uh, kind of a, a big revelation i never knew it until about uh, 10 years back so it was huge to me uh, my blog and i seriously seriously urge you to buy this book james watt by andrew carnegie so thank you all i hope i didn't take too long i hope i didn't rush it or i hope i didn't uh, you know skip over some difficult parts uh, there are much much better sources much better uh, you know videos uh, websites and so on as uh, we can talk to we can uh, we can see uh, probably we'll have uh, some other uh, one of the things i want to do is build a steam engine now Uh, so maybe i'll do it one of these times so with that i'll conclude this presentation and thank you all for listening and uh, we can take questions at this point uh gopu if you can uh, uh close your uh, presentation we can uh, we can have a quick uh, discussion maybe uh, uh, mm. 10 10 15 minutes uh, probably okay uh, so i know you you talked about a, a lot of uh, these things some of which perhaps need visualization if you are really talking about how the engine functions right um, i so want to focus course... more i want to focus more on the history than on the engineering absolutely, uh, absolutely. and some yeah. some things are yeah some things are probably more for a course than for a lecture right so true, true. that's why i didn't put true. too many visuals there true so i i know i want to touch upon few uh, key points Uh, and then uh, ask your opinion on that uh, so it's it's obvious the way we have uh, uh, you know looked at making use of energy right from a human uh, you know own uh, effort at spending energy and making work happen yeah to using drought animals right yeah so the drought animals really helped us in a certain uh, way yeah and then we were stuck there right, right. Uh, water wheels help so that is the that is a point at which you see uh, perhaps large waterfalls or uh, uh, you know flowing yeah. rivers yeah, yeah. Uh, right but yeah. until that point uh, really in a sense we were only looking at uh, 
the thermal content never as a uh, work driver it was yeah. only to heat up right right yeah so the 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 key jump i mean it doesn't matter who came up with it yeah but the real key jump is this concept that uh, the chemical or the the uh, you know the, the fire the the heat yeah the, it has got a lot of energy right which can be somehow passed on to water that's where the latent heat part comes in right right and then it can be transferred into work right right now obviously this is not one aha moment one person comes and sits there and saying hey i'm going to take all this thermal energy i'm going to convert that into uh, steam uh, i mean pack it into steam and then convert that into mechanical energy right so it's little by little by little by little uh, people have uh, moved it to a working model perfected the model use it merely to lift water uh, then to maybe you know operate a wheel the moment you operate a wheel then you can pretty much run any of the industry yeah and then you move to a locomotive so it's a right. fascinating uh, engineering advancement yeah uh, no this is where you know try to put that in context uh not from the coal or uh, coal's availability woods non availability etc yeah this engineering where uh, how is uh, england and scotland figuring visa we the continental europe because nobody else was there in the game honestly neither china nor india so it's it's effectively it's only europe and the uk yeah so uh, even so no no so this is where the wood makes a difference because coal is much you can drive a steam engine with wood you can yeah but it, it doesn't have enough energy packed into it right and that makes a big difference right. because england was forced to buy you know forced to they were, you don't import wood okay today the coal trade is a huge trade there is no international wood, wood firewood trade right coal is still being traded right coal yeah, packs yeah. so much more go, go, go. exactly it, it comes from the thermal uh, uh, content of coal versus uh, even the best wood possible no, correct my, my point is not even that gopu it is about uh, the engineering capability right no, okay you learned that coal is being used by uh, britain yeah so what stopped others from building it quickly i am i am my point is that there is a certain level of sophistication in engineering tinkering the tinkering that 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 you talked about they weren't even tinkering they had already yeah they were, so they were not even tinkering i think that was the thing see christian huygens or newton could have done this they didn't do it christian huygens used gunpowder he thought of gunpowder as the you know thermal energy he was powering a fountain the mindset that you take and remember there are brilliant theoretical scientists in england this is papen actually worked for newton newton even didn't even look at a steam engine he has never written imagine what newton would have done with thermodynamics he is not even dealt with the topic okay right so uh, and, and and not just him a lot of people uh, could have done a lot of things uh, decart could have done that he was you know that period you are talking about brilliant people who lived there bernoulli gauss all these other guys who lived there like right? gauss came much later gauss later yeah Uh, oiler perhaps but there are a lot of other people there are a lot of engineers who are tinkering with it and really this uh, new james watt is not because he is a theoretician but he was a, you know you know he was a tinkerer he is literally had to tinker on it for like 12 years this is i would give the example of uh, sajay brin today or mark zuckerberg who is tinkering it's not that the facebook or the google search engine is something that some other software engineer could not have made and we had a large number of software engineers and this applies to every single industry this applies even to the textile industry this is this is the magic that we are not very clear why did england in 40 years and in the 40 years actually 1740 to 1780 coinciding with this james watt trying to struggle right. with right they had a textile revolution they completely trans india as a textile superpower with cotton for 2500 years and probably even older okay egypt iran they were all doing this stuff they couldn't grow cotton but india was doing cotton china was doing things with silk marvels with silk from where 6th century bc or something like that okay they had a 2500 year head start over england what are they doing 
40 years, England revolutionized textile industries. Where did that come from? Where did that, you know? So that's the kind of thing that I think applies here also. So we, you are looking at very one specific industry. Why didn't they convert mechanical power to kinetic power? Perfectly reasonable. But we don't know. There's, there's no one thing we can point out and say, oh, that, that's it. There's no one thing. There's a, no, there's no, a bunch go, of go, 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 go. My, uh, my point is slightly different. What I'm saying is that it is the engineering tinkering. You know, you are saying why Newton didn't do it. Newton probably was never interested in building right. engineering stuff. So if you really look at it, there is the theoretician and there is a practitioner. Yeah, practitioner. no, no. Newton, Newton was much more a tinkerer than you give him credit for. He's not no, like Einstein. I, I, you know, I'm, not, I'm not dismissing him. Yeah. The difference between a Watt and a Newton. They are from different era, but let's just look right. at that. Right? Yeah. Uh, Edison and an Einstein. They're different, right? right? You are really looking at practically making something happen right. and then constantly improving it. Right. Right. Now, you see a, a, a non working steam engine model. Yeah. And then you feel that you can actually uh, make some changes to it and it's, then you can make it work. It is a working model, but he, he, he was able to make it a much, much better model. No, no. First, I mean, the uh, you know, your representation, you said he first came across something ah, that yeah, was yeah. not really working. Yeah, right? yeah the model that that's he was when he, the yeah, physical the model. model. Then yeah, he gets yeah. into it. Right. Then he looks at it and says, hey, I can improve this. Right. Right. That, you know, that I can improve this. Yeah. Comes after you have some degree of apprenticeship, whether you, whether you uh, did a great job or not, you, you know, right. you get into a sort of a, uh, you know, a yeah, smithy, uh, yeah, yeah, metal working place. So you can basically tinker, cut, join, bend, right. create, create all the necessary bits and pieces for making a machine. Right. 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 I'm saying fundamentally from what little that we know. Yeah. Even to this day, we're yeah. struggling to get that into our people. Let's yeah. say I'm taking India. Right. Yeah. So we go to college and we don't want to really hammer something. We don't yeah. want to bend something. We don't want that's, to connect something. That's the problem. We go to college. What didn't go to college? Okay. Yeah. And Edison didn't go to college. If they had gone to, is what, you know, what uh, Hardy said of Ramanujan. If he had been more educated, he'd be less Ramanujan. If they had gone to college, they would not have been Edison and what. So, college <laughs> teaches you what the tinkerers, you know, provide. I, I'm a uh, little, I've, so, so, sorry, go, go but today you can't say, you know, if you want to become a tinkerer, don't go to college. Right? I'm not saying that. Yeah. Well, what I'm we not need saying to do that. Is, but most yeah. people don't go to college. People who go to college do not tinker. It doesn't happen. Look at what Elon Musk has done with rocketry. Right? One guy. What, what, what is the resource constraint that NASA could possibly have had that Elon has not had? In fact, the resource constraint is what has made him much more efficient. And that's probably the other factor there. What was terrified of, you know, going to debt? Can you imagine, you know, I, if I borrow 200 pounds, I could go to jail. So, I want, you know, I'm terrified of doing this. Can you imagine that world today? So, right. yeah, yeah. But I mean, I'm not saying, but who tinkers? Who tinkers? Almost nobody tinkers, okay? Tinkerers do go to college and they do interesting stuff. And, you know, uh, and that, that I think... The tinkering is not encouraged and it's not India, it's worldwide. I don't think, and you're seeing this, you're seeing somebody like Peter Thiel complain about it in Silicon Valley. He says, they're not tinkering. He says, uh, uh, Google isn't, uh, you know, innovating anymore. He's accusing Google of not being innovative. This was, Microsoft was accused of this. US manufacturing industry has been accused of this for the last 40 years, ever since Japan took over. Japan has been accused of this by Korean innovators. You're seeing this in every industry, in every field, you know, you're talking about all kinds of things. So, you know, you're, if you're trying for a larger point, I don't know, I don't know what you're asking, but I'm saying you're seeing that even today in different fields. Uh, uh, what I'm saying is that despite all that, there are changes happening. Yeah. yeah. And there are improvements happening. Right. But they're happening only in certain clusters. So right. those clusters are doing something right. 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 I don't right. know if you can just simply copy that and replicate it. I mean, even, yeah. even in the Indian context, we are talking about, government is talking about utter tinkering labs in schools. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's all there. Yeah. I don't know how 
that's going to be a big difference to uh, uh, you know the, the culture uh, you know if a, if a school uh, asks for a model you go to richy street and buy it and then uh, yeah. you know, uh, show it and so richy street is also not thing where uh, we encourage right right so so, so uh, this this is what i'm talking about this this you know that comes i don't know where that comes from okay i don't know where that in the urge to tinker and do little things comes from we don't know where that comes from and where the energy to persist with it comes from okay because it's not the start everybody will start to persist with it for years it's mm-hmm. that's something magical and that's the, that's what separates uh, edison and wabot and others from you know being the transformative figures from anybody else pretty much anybody else so people are you know, people find it easier to copy than to do the tinkering to get that original uh, kind of uh, you know breakthrough thing okay so uh, there are not uh, not many questions per se there is one question from mishru narayanan on any hint on how the know how of thermodynamics helped to make these engineers better there was no thermodynamics yeah the thermodynamics came after the engine became steam engine became popular people right. realized that you should study the dynamics of heat so thermodynamics came from steam engine inspired the science of thermodynamics was inspired by the steam engine and then it led to the development of things like petrol engines internal combustion engines mm. uh, you know city there's what is the carno city carno carno came up with the theoretical side once the theory was then developed then it helped to improve other things but the almost you know and i think there are several people across the world like nasim nicholas tali but balaji srinivasan all these people are active on twitter who are telling you people are giving credit for scientists and then saying inventor engineers are doing stuff no 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 engineers do it and then scientists come up with the theory which has you know yeah, almost so always reason. almost yeah. always yeah 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 very rarely that uh, scientists come up with the theory and then uh, engineer say hey fine you know i will use this theory and build a machine kind right. of a thing very rarely that happens okay so uh, you know in terms of the big jump subsequently right from the external combustion uh, resulting in a steam engine moving to an internal combustion was yeah. a big jump which made us make really small engines and uh, lightweight and that no. resulted in a huge automobile revolution yeah mm-hmm. sorry you were saying yeah that. no even the jump from a stationary engine to a mobile you know smaller engine correct took correct. enormous uh, this thing and that you know and this is where uh, the other similarity you know the edison tesla uh, watt and uh, uh, richard trevithick uh, thing uh, took to me you know so james watt did this so why were the germans so you can say you know germans not firewood is not a problem and all that so why didn't the germans or the french i'm talking about germans and french because they are very close to england they could see what correct, was happening correct correct right? that was my i'm not talking my about china and india because or arabia because they are far away yeah. but why weren't they, or even the americans americans were not correct they were fitting st- steam engines to boats that was america okay america took the steam engine and put it on boats but to put it on a railway to an englishman um, so that was kind of interesting uh, to make it a smaller engine and then get it to world and that the trevithick uh, stevenson engine story is another interesting story but it would take an hour and a half probably even longer to tell that story so i kept away and then 100 years later you have charles parsons who came along with the you know the turbine revolution we don't talk about yes. turbines at all yes we didn't talk about turbine at all i mean uh, the real real value of uh, you know uh, where your steam suddenly becomes so much more powerful exactly so that took 100 years 150 yeah. years right by the time uh, the internal combustion engine had become significant before that steam steam became a you know steam turbines became a thing what tried to do it but apparently what had an idea people suggested but he said you know you what metal can stand a thousand revolutions in minute nothing mm. so it's like it's not possible that was what stayed right. on it so he you know uh, the basic concept that somebody had proposed that he said uh, and parsons took that on that's a much later story most of us don't know the difference between if you are not a mechanical engineer you don't know the difference between a turbine and an engine Yes. and i found out i found out about only vashla smil reading vashla smil's book i found out i didn't study it in engineering okay and the productive one you know, the understand and most of us don't know we, think, we still think of uh, what what is there in ennur power plant right mm-hmm. so they are all turbines most of us think of them as engines the understanding between engine and turbine doesn't exist outside the people who start study mechanical engineering they don't understand it vast majority yes. don't know yes. so yes. 
so that yeah. so so this is uh, and that i think tinkering and other kinds of aspects uh, yeah and, see, there, and, there, and there, the general public at large doesn't need to know it's like fiber optic versus coaxial cable or transistors versus uh, you know vacuum tube no they are still uh, important because yeah. that's when you are really uh, jumping orders of magnitude right right so uh, you know you have turbines and then you have uh, suddenly you know you have very high uh, powerful electrical generators right the moment you have uh, you know high quality uh, electrical uh, power generation and then transmission right and uh, today we are talking about actually uh, uh, electrical uh, uh, vehicles right? right so we are jumping from uh, completely looking at uh, you know uh, finishing off the internal combustion engines they have been doing that for 100 years the automobile yeah. story is another interesting story okay for about 35 years the difference is the same from uh, the time benz and daimler these are the first guys who really put an engine to mm -hmm. internal combustion engine to a, uh, a horse car right and made it run from that time until about 1920 this is 15 years after uh, even ford had come up with this mass manufacturing assembly line process from 18 Uh, 80, 1885. That period was when the internal combustion engine really comes into play uh, for transportation. Until 1920, with Ford's engine coming, even the aeroplane powered, you know, it's powered using an aeroplane. This thing. Uh, until that time, petrol is or diesel are not really significantly better than electric or steam. Okay, and the key difference apparently comes with certain improvements in fuel chemistry. certain improvements in fuel chemistry for petrol the fraction this is remember the petrol industry when diesel engine and petrol engine neither diesel nor petrol existed the fuels that they used are different mm. okay so in steam's case the engine followed the fuel in in for diesel and petrol the fuel followed the engine several years later literally okay uh, so that that's the other uh, astounding historical aspect and this is why to me i gave a historic uh, talk about history because the history aspect to me is just astounding and no engineer studies it perhaps outside his field computer engineers will understand some history in terms of computers mechanical engineers to some aspect of and there will be automobile and steam guys and turbine guys and you know they don't necessarily all so this story is to me i find very interesting so uh, this presentation actually came from a uh, Uh, one I made for the Savita College that because I'm teaching that inventions and discoveries course, uh, and uh, I'm not sure that you know there some of them are struggling with it. Some of them really understand and appreciate it. Some of them they are just getting into college, right? So that large base uh, knowledge is not there. So it's kind of uh, hard for some of them to appreciate uh, this. Uh, I think I think large, several larger colleges should offer this course. a uh, course like this a history of science history of engineering kind of course to get a perspective on what it is and i think it would be a very useful for administrators economists and planners you know mm. get sense of what they are you know what you do uh, to get that 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 sense they at least focus money on the right places that that sense yeah wonderful uh, gopu i think we have taken quite a bit of time and uh, this is a very uh, uh, oh. interesting uh, yeah not not many questions so the whole thing uh, the, the whole lecture really uh, uh, made us focus on uh, the development and the key people and what kind of improvements were they making and when we when we, in common parlance we say you know so and so did such and such is it really the case yeah. and and the and the uh, uh, the sort of uh, uh, historical uh, evolution of an idea and uh, how that becomes a powerful business idea yeah and that's uh, that that was really uh, fascinating thank you uh, uh, for the lecture and uh, it's a great thing that you know we are entering our fifth year and there will be many many more lectures every month uh, so we want uh, all of you to be there uh, uh, as patrons uh, again once again next month we will be uh, meeting you with another lecture from arav mehra science forum thank you all bye bye thank you